Hello, everyone. Um, this is the Art Lounge Alley, Guns Project Part 71. This is a remake of uh, the special stream, Gil Elfgren Part 5. Um, Gil Elfgren is one of my favorite artists. He's incredible. Um, pinup artist, a beautiful work. Um, so I've been creating some stuff, um, these special streams, talking about him, talking about his uh, influencers, talking about history, uh, the illustration history, um, and just really diving into um, the illustration world. Uh, I have this book that um, shows all of his work from certain eras, from the 20s to the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, all the way up to the 70s. And maybe, no, I think it's, it stops at the 70s. Um, but prior to really showing you guys all that work and um, all these different eras, I wanted to talk more about Gil Elfgren. I wanted to talk about who he was uh, and also give you guys insight into um, some of the artists that have inspired him. So... Uh, I'm going to do a brief introduction about of Gil Elfgren for those of you who are just tuning in for the very first time. You guys can always catch up to the previous special intros by heading over to the video section and filtering it based on collection, which will open up all these folders for you. You can either go to the highlights folder and uh, check out all the previous Gil Elfgren intros, or you can go to the project stream, which uh, has them there as well. Um, but for those of you who are just tuning in for the very first time, I'm just going to give you guys a brief introduction while showing you his work, um, a slideshow of his work. So without further ado, let's, let's see who Gil Elfgren was. This is Gil Elfgren right there, born in 1914 and was active all the way up until 1980. Uh, that is his beautiful work. Um, I do encourage you guys to view this in full screen if you're not already. I think you can really see more detail uh, and just really see the beauty of uh, his work. Um, so, uh, who was Gil Elfgren? He was the most important pinup and glamour artist of the 20th century. Uh, one of his most recognizable works is from his Coca-Cola illustrations. And I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen that before. Um, um, and you will see this actually in the slideshow as well. Um, what what I'm referring to, what the Coca-Cola illustrations are. Um, Gil Elfgren's uh, Coca-Cola subjects portrayed the American dream of a secure, comfortable lifestyle. But his well-known illustrations from magazine uh, stories often captured timeless scenes that reflected the hopes, fears, and joys of their readers. In the field of advertising, alongside his Coca-Cola work, he contributed to campaigns for prominent American companies and products such as Orange Crush, Shields Beer, Sealy Mattress, General Electric, uh, Sylvania, and Napa Auto Parts. With his work for Brown and Bigelow, and that's a really important name to uh, remember as well, company um, hired a lot of um, a lot of illustrators. Uh, they gave him a lot of inspiration. All of them are kind of connected to all these different companies. Uh, so, with his work for Brown and Bigelow, uh, Coca Cola, and other national advertising assignments. Um, and his magazine world work, Elfgren was much in demand as an artist. His time booked up more than a year ahead of his output. Which is so amazing to think, you know, you're at that level of skill and at that level of demand that you don't even have to think about uh, where you're going to find work. It all comes to you and you're overbooked, basically. Um, Elfgren stood out not just for his painting and advertising, um, graphics he was also a notable professional photographer and that's something really important to uh, talk about i think as well is just um how it's not just coming from his imagination you know sometimes people think about these artists and they're like oh well you know they're they're really talented they're really skilled they're able to just um 
come up with this stuff out of nowhere and if i'm not doing that then it's not really worth it and uh, this is just kind of there to dispel it I mean, he did work off of photography and it is something that you guys are going to see um through these sl uh, slide uh images um that he worked off of photographs but he he kind of played around with the photos. He didn't really draw them exactly or paint them exactly as they were. Um, he would just, um, well, let me just show you instead. I think uh, one that's coming up is gonna give you a really good example. And this is it right here. And you could see how the original photograph um, isn't exactly the same and as his painting. He exaggerated certain things, um, so he wasn't completely working from imagination, and he wasn't completely working from photographs. It was uh, it was good in between. Um, so just to bring that up again, it's to dispel this idea that it all has to be incredibly imaginative or you have to have such a great understanding that no references are needed. So even if such a skilled illustrator as Gil Elvgren still uh, used other mediums to help him develop beautiful work. Um, so don't shy away from using references, don't shy away from uh, using other mediums, whether it's photography or sculpting even, something that uh, I've brought up several times in my other streams. Um, to give you a better understanding or guide you to developing something that you're working on. Um, you know, you don't have to become a photographer. Some people will ask, well, if you're going to use uh, photography, if you're going to take pictures, why not just be a photographer? Well, the answer to that is because you're interested in painting. You like the process of painting. You like the medium for painting or drawing, if you want, or sculpting, whichever it is. Uh, and that's what it's really about. So to become better at those mediums, it's okay to borrow others to develop a better uh, better result. You know, um, I think sculpting really helps when it comes to drawing and painting because it gives you a three-dimensional understanding of your subject, um, whatever part it is, whether it's the human body or parts of the human body. Once you're able to uh, internalize it in your mind's eye, you're able to paint it three-dimensionally which allows you to do it in any perspective. Um, and uh, yeah, you don't have to depend as much as you, you could see even in this photo that he didn't depend as much on the reference. Like if you look at her hair, it's more lush. There's more volume to it. You exaggerated that a bit um, as well as chest, her smile, her, her cheeks, uh, her eyebrows. He, he changed those things slightly, even the gestures of, of her arm you know, what that looks like, um, uh, to just give a little bit more vibrance, more flair to the painting itself. So, um, yeah, if you take a look at the heels, for example, as well, like they're really pointy and that kind of highlights his composition as well. What kind of, um, uh, emotion or feeling he wants to invoke from the viewers. There's this very, um, I guess, suggestive element about a lot of his paintings, as you guys have seen. So just going back to uh, more about him, um, long before he attended his first class in 1933, Elfgren had been impressed by the early pretty girl illustrators like Charles Donna Gibson, Howard Chandler Christie, uh, Harrison Fisher, as well as McLellan Barkley, Haddon H. Sumblum, Andrew Loomis, another one of my favorite artists, uh, Charles E. Chambers, and Pruitt Carter. Um, this right here is something that some of you might be familiar with. I think this is probably a little bit more of a my generation time period where you would see these advertisements and billboards with uh, these images, but he's very well known for these Coca-Cola ads. Um, and one of the names mentioned actually had an H. Sumblum. You could see in the previous streams how much influence he had on Gil Elvgren. And uh, all the opportunities that had an H. Sumblum and along with other uh, other names mentioned here uh, that they got 
in all these companies are the same ones that Gil Elfgren shot for as well. So it kind of helped them, uh, you know, being a fan, uh, um, recognizing their work, reading about them, getting to know them, and just really knowing their process allowed them to follow in their footsteps, to have some sort of direction. You know, it's one thing to be able to hone your craft and create uh, what you're uh, looking for to create. It's another thing to know where to go with it. And I think him being more familiar with all these artists, in fact, actually meeting them as well. I think he met with uh, Haddon and H. Sumblum. They worked together for some time. They, uh, he learned from him. Uh, and you could see how how much of an influence he was in it. Um, Haddon H. Sumblum was also part of the Coca-Cola brand, also created some of the well-known um, images that we know today. For example, Santa Claus, right? The image of Santa Claus is actually something that Haddon H. Sumblum uh, created, something that we all know very well, or something that we still see, I think, in advertisement when it comes to Coca-Cola during the Christmas season. Um, that was Haddon H. Sumblum's creation. And he also was the creator for the Quaker Oats Man. So next time you guys go to the shopping center and grocery store and you check out those uh, Quaker Oats, that logo was designed by Haddon H. Sumblum. Big influence on uh, Gil Elfgren. Um, so early on, Elfgren tore out magazine covers and individual pages bearing illustrations by artists he admired or who interested him which became his ritual. These pages became a comprehensive collection that would later influence both his painting technique and the approach to particular commissions. Um, so I think that also highlights a, an important thing as well. For those of you who are interested in whatever field it is, whether it's comic books, whether it's um, painting or advertising or whatever, just being immersed in their work, uh, being immersed by people that you're interested in, uh, helps keep you motivated and um, also opportunities for you to learn from all those uh, all, all those artists, all those interests. Um, so going on, Elfgren shared his admiration for the Brandywine School philosophy of painting with Norman Rockwell. Uh, and the two men first became acquainted in 1947. So just having that be uh, the introduction for now um, to continue on with um, where I left off last time. Um, and uh, some other really important names I want to mention before I jump back to uh, Howard, uh, Norman Rockwell is Howard Pyle. And this is um, the man who created the Brandywine School uh, philosophy. Um, he is also very well known for his uh, depiction of the pirate outfit. So movies like Pirates of the Caribbean, uh, how Johnny Depp was dressed, that was based on Howard Pyle's idea of what pirates would look like. So of course it's a little bit exaggerated. Um, it's not exactly what they look like, but it is his... Um, it's his spin on it, and it became very uh, well known. And that's what he's one of the things that he's well known for as well. Um, he also did some time developing uh, stories um, of Robin Hood, and you guys will see that in a few minutes. But um, his philosophy and his ways of uh, teaching really brought about uh, other really amazing artists. So this is right here, what you're seeing, these are illustrations from, um, from Robin Hood. Uh, but his, uh, his approach to teaching art was um, basically based on philosophy. Like he didn't go into technical detail about things. He wasn't teaching people exactly how to draw this, that, and the other. Um, he would rather take people out into the open, have them... Uh, sit in nature and paint in nature while talking about history, talking about philosophy, and uh, inspiring people through experiences, through thought, th you know, because I think uh, art is actually a, a thought process. It's not just sitting down and, uh, you know, just this creativity pouring out of your pen, pencil, or brush. It's It really is a thinking process, and uh, that was his motivation, basically. He would get people thinking. He would make them uh, wonder about life, wonder about, uh, 
you know, all these philosophical concepts, thinking about history and how the human evolution has uh, came to be what it was at that time. Um, and yeah, he didn't really believe in a technical thing. He didn't think that that was a way to teach art. And that's something that I um, have talked about in the previous streams as well. And once you guys um, check out the previous Gil Elvgren parts, you can get a little bit better idea of Howard Pyle and uh, some of the artists as well. But as I go through these influential artists, uh, I will be talking about uh, Howard Pyle's concepts and philosophies as well. Um, but it's just important to note how he played an important role through all these artists, all the artists that influenced Gil Elvgren and Gil Elvgren himself. As, as you heard, he was a big fan of uh, Brandywine School of Philosophy and um, Norman Rockwell, who I will be discussing today. So this is Norman Rockwell, 1894 to 1978. Uh, and to give you guys a better idea of um, his work, or rather his history, um, just giving you guys a quick demonstration of some of his work as well, while talking about his life experience as an illustrator and in general as as an artist um, so norman rockwell was a painter and illustrator uh, rockwell is most famous for the cover illustrations of everyday life he created for the saturday evening post magazine over nearly five decades among, among the best known for rockwell's work are the willie gillis series which you're seeing right now um, rosie the riveteer the Problems We All Live With, which is a great painting. That's uh, Rosie the Riveteer right there. Um, and that is The Problems We All Live With, um, the painting that you're looking at right now. Um, the Saying Grace is another one. And the Four Freedom series. Uh, and these are all paintings that you guys are going to see today. He's also noted for his 64-year relationship with the Boy Scouts of America, during which he produced covers for their publications. Rockwell was a prolific artist, producing more than 4,000 original works in his lifetime. 4,000, that's a lot, considering that painting is such a laborious task. And um, just looking at his work, and I'm going to show you guys, I'm going to talk about each and every painting, you're going to see... Uh, just how amazing his understanding of painting was. And to just think of that 4,000 paintings, it's overwhelming. It's it's incredible. Um, and, uh, yeah, it just it, uh, leaves me speechless, to be honest. Um, for those of you who have ventured into oil paintings, you guys know exactly how long it takes to create one painting, you know, and what that process is like and how much there, that goes into it. Uh, understanding color mixing, you know, that's one of the most important uh, steps, you know, I think w when it comes to oil painting and how difficult that can be and how uh, less forgiving it is in comparison to digital art. You know, you're always control Z away from uh, making, uh, correcting your mistake and which takes like a split second. Whereas when it comes to painting, oil painting, that's a lot harder to do. You know, you, you would have to just completely smudge it out and start again with another layer on top of another layer. It's uh, it's very much a layering process as well. Um, there's a lot of drying time that needs to go into it before you add another layer because you're working with oil. Um, so yeah, there, there's a lot that goes into it and you guys will see just through all these paintings how much detail and how much like different colors that he used to uh, create the, the these amazing works. Um, so many of his works uh, appear overly sweet in the opinions of modern critics, especially the Saturday Evening Post covers, which tend towards idealistic or sentimentalized portrayals of American life. Uh, this has led often to uh, deprecatory adjective Rockwell-esque. Uh, consequently, Rockwell is not considered a quote-unquote serious painter by some contemporary artists. Who regarded his work as Borgois and Quiche. 
uh, writer Vladimir Nabokov stated that Rockwell's brilliant technique was put to banal use and wrote in his novel uh, Penin that Dali is really Norman Rockwell's twin brother kidnapped by gypsies in babyhood. And of course, he's joking. Uh, he's called an illustrator instead of an artist by some critics, a designation he did not mind, as that was what he called himself. In his later years, however, Rockwell began receiving more attention as a painter when he chose more serious subjects, such as a series on racism for Look Magazine. One example of this more serious work is The Problem We All Live With, which deals with the issue of school racial integration. Now remember, this is like 19... Um, this is like 1950s, right? And they're talking about all this ridiculous skin color stuff, like, oh, if you're this skin color, then you should be here. Absolutely absurd. Um, incredibly ignorant. And the fact that we're still dealing with this today is just, uh, it's appalling. I, I still can't believe it. And I think a lot of it just has to do with the fact that there are uh, older people who are just brainwashing kids. It's not like 12 or 13 year olds are starting to think this, you know, that they ask their parents these questions and their parents were, um, you know, brainwashed by a generation that had to deal with um, a lot of that as well. That was like a racist topic as well. And, you know, the further back the time we go, the less and less tolerant people were of race. So it's just basically brainwashing through generations. You know, it's people just being conditioned to think that way because that's what they were raised in, the kind of environment they were raised in. And because they were shackled to their families and they were shackled to you know, the ignorance of their family members, uh, they just perpetuated that. So, you know, it's unfortunate that kids nowadays still have these ignorant beliefs, but a lot of it just has to do with education. It has to do with uh, terrible uh, parenting, you know. So I think if we had better education systems, if we have teachers who are paid well, who are very knowledgeable in, in a progressive direction, uh, that could tackle all these issues for instance if there's a kid who's expressing some sort of racist point of views or whatever they can actually be assigned to talk with a, a counselor you know that that's something that even though it does single them out it's beneficial for them in the long run you know it's rather rather single you out and have you uh, get some proper education and some counseling or you know something that um might change your perspective and make you a little bit wiser as opposed to singling them out and being like, oh, that's a racist, he's terrible. He's a terrible kid. You know, so I think that if teachers and schools were much better, we would have better results. We would have uh, opportunities to have these kids raised in more of a progressive uh, direction, you know, that, that they wouldn't continue on from like, you know, from a young age up until they're older, embracing these ignorant points of views i mean granted things are a lot better i think when it comes to racial tension now than they were when back in the 50s and 40s and stuff but still it's still a problem still a topic it's absolutely appalling and disgusting um but uh yeah this is basically a painting of ruby bridges um she's flanked by white federal mar marshals walking to school past the wall defaced by racist graffiti and you could see that uh lightly in the background with like all these uh, tomato smears on there it's just a repulsive but it's a really powerful painting i mean it really does um show this ridiculous aggression this idiotic aggression and unfortunately um you know this this poor girl um had to deal with that but if you notice, actually, the the federal marshals are wearing these like bands around their uh, arms, which is very similar to another political movement that isn't great. Um, and I think that's kind of there as a, uh, symbol, a symbolism as well. Um, but uh, yeah, just going on with that, um, this 1964, so it wasn't really 50s, it was a little bit later. This 1964 painting was 
displayed in the White House when Bridges met with President Barack Obama in 2011. So that's a pretty powerful um, experience, right? For somebody who has gone through that uh, terrible experience of having all this racism and aggression towards you so much so that it's like a painting about you um, to actually meeting the first black president, you know? Uh, I think that that's probably a really, well, uh, most definitely a monumental moment. And uh, I'm happy that she was able to experience that. Um, so Elvgren shared his admiration for the Brandywine School uh, philosophy of painting with Rockwell. The two men first became acquainted in 1947 when they both attended uh, a Brown and Bigelow uh, manager's convention in St. Paul. And friendship developed. Elvgren and Rockwell were two of a kind. Both had uh, the knack for um, portraying real people in totally believable situations. The difference was that Rockwell had the choice of almost unlimited array of subjects for his paintings, whereas Elvgren seemingly had less freedom in his pinup uh, assignments. Yet Rockwell soon took the opportunity to tell Elvgren what the letter had already uh, often heard from other artists, that he admired his work and envied him for his job of painting the world's most beautiful women. Their meeting marked the beginning of a long association, which even led eventually to their sharing artistic secrets during their annual encounters. Uh, Norman Rockwell was also a student of the Art Students League under Brigman. And I think that's a really important, uh, well, two important names there, Art Students League and uh, and Brigman. And Brigman has great uh, amount of books talking about uh, anatomy. So for those of you who are learning, I think it's uh, it's worth investing in one of the books and and uh, and studying them, reading them, uh, drawing from them. Um, and the Art Students League being an excellent school, and it's actually something that is, uh, it's a school repeating for a lot of these artists. If you guys go back to the previous um, Gil Elvgren intros, you'll notice that a lot of the artists who inspired Gil Elvgren also attended the Art Students League. So the history for the school goes back to like late 1800s, uh, all the way up until modern day. Like you guys can actually visit the school uh, it's a great school. It allows anybody to come in and take classes. You know, all you have to do is just pay a, an affordable rate per month. I think it's like somewhere in 150, depending on how many days a week you want to take it. Uh, it goes up to $200 per month. Uh, so I think it's much more affordable than having to pay astronomical prices for college tuitions or whatever. So if you wanted to go over there, you could uh, study with some of the most renowned artists up until modern day. Uh, just take drawing classes i think you just pay like five ten bucks you go in there and there's a model present for you and you could just sit down and draw from the model so um it's a, it's an excellent opportunity for people to to start drawing to be part of the artistic community and uh it's at a very affordable price along with all this history you know all these artists uh, incredible artists who've attended that school and uh created like this amazing artistic community um, but yeah, I think it's just Im important to mention how uh, interesting it is that they're all kind of tied in through these schools and how Brigman also influenced a lot of these artists as well. Um, so that's a quick little intro <laughs> um, to Norman Rockwell. Um, and I'd like to continue to talk about all these paintings. I mean, just looking at this, you know, this painting right here, and you could see how... Um, just enter in full screen mode. Yeah, you could see how, uh, how much a color mixture went into this. Like uh, just looking at the background and looking at all the yellows, whites and blues. Uh, that he used in order to create this really realistic texture. Um, also, looking at the hands, you know, I think is incredible amount of uh, color mixture there as well. There's like a certain um, realistic feel to them where I feel like even um, 
it's more realistic than a painting, I want to say. How he rendered those hands and for each and every person in the painting is incredible. So you could see how great of an understanding he had of anatomy. And um, yet, as you guys will see through the slideshows, uh, he also kind of retains this like fantastical element to faces and expressions, um, which I think is something similar to one of my other favorite artists, John Buscema. If you look at the comic books and pages, um, he has this like sophisticated way of drawing the figure and also faces and their, their expressions, but yet with just the amount, right amount of detail to, um, to give it a fantastical sort of vibe. So a good mix between realism and, and fantasy. And I, I'll highlight that actually in some of Norman Rockwell's paintings as well as we move through. So this is um, the other painting that was mentioned earlier, what he was known for, um, which is saying grace, you know, and it just highlights how uh, fortunate a lot of people are, you know, living in the States to have this opportunity to like sit in a comfortable, uh, safe space with, you know, um, with warmth, you know, well clothed with abundance of food. And you could see like, uh, just this gentleman at the bottom left holding a cigar, you know, just kind of showing this um, leisurely sort of lifestyle, you know, that you could just sit there, smoke a cigar, and drink some coffee and read a newspaper, you know, and that's unfortunately not the case for a lot of people even today, you know, just looking around the world and what's going on, how people are treating each other and what kind of stuff is going on politically and economically. It's, a, it's horrendous. It's, it's absolutely repulsive. It's barbaric, you know, and I'm just appalled at the fact that, you know, it's 2022 and people are still acting so basic, you know? Um, but yeah, this just kind of highlights how fortunate we are. And it's just showing by the humility and everybody in the painting focusing towards this older woman who's sitting at the table and and appreciating that you know and i think um just from his understanding of composition how well, well he's able to do it it's taking a look at like the gentleman at the bottom right you don't really see much of him right you could only see like some parts of his face and some parts of his hands uh, but you could tell that his focus is directed towards the woman as well as the teenagers sitting at the table the gentleman at the top left is also kind of like in this humble state um looking at the woman and just realizing like hmm, it is a really important moment so you could see how norman rockwell really had this great way of telling story from in just one it's just one panel if you wanted to talk about it in comic book form it's just one panel and yet there's so much going on there and it's such a powerful message and certain, uh, uh, such a powerful um, vibe there uh, that you could tell he, he, really, uh, he really understood his craft. He really understood and loved the process, you know, to be able to create something like this that has so much uh, emotion and feeling to it. Um, but yeah, just, you know, I think it's also interesting how it's contrasting uh, generations you know you have these older guys around and then you have these two I'm gonna say they're teenagers probably early 20s uh, guys who are sitting at the table and you could tell that they're in that like you know stage in their life where they're trying to be as independent as possible where they don't really want to display any sort of like uh, humility or anything like that they don't want to be controlled by uh, the older generation and there's a sense of rebelliousness with like of course like the cigarettes as well and uh just their their demeanor but at the same time despite that they're able to recognize the importance of that uh of that moment you know they are humbled by her presence as well and by her recognizing this um this moment this reality in a way and then of course you have somebody who's much younger who's really just a kid um just being influenced by her and um saying grace with her you know whereas everybody else is kind of just at um at awe i guess of her actions so i think it's very very well done i really enjoy that 
Um, and I, I also, what I really like about Norman Rockwell is his ability to pick the right tones, you know, not just colors, you know, it's just also the tone as well. Um, you could see that from like the coat hanger and the clothes that are on there to pretty much all the clothes that are worn by the people in the, in the painting that it's still kind of in the same hue, right? It's still similar, like despite them being different, the pants are the pants of one of the teenagers or um, young adults is definitely brighter than the jacket, but there's this, the tone is so much closer, you know, than something completely contrasting uh, that it works. So despite there being many different colors, like even the red in the condiments on the table um, and the red of the bag, and, and there's like little hints of red all around from the chairs that they're sitting on to the red on the hat. Um, you know, um, and the hat on the, on the floor as well. Like all those things, they're, they're, all these colors, they still work together with everything else. They're in the right tone. So he understood how to mi mix everything and not make anything really pop out. But at the same time, um, give everything individualistic attention. And uh, still using contrast as well. Like if you look at the background, right? If you're looking at um, what's going on there, like this industrial sort of city, I guess, um, or town or whatever, wherever they are, you could see like there's like steam coming off from a train that's passing by. And there are all these like industrial looking buildings. So you could see that it's like a really busy area, but it's all like, it's all done in white. And um, the kids shirt is really white and some of the elements on the table in the very forefront are also white um mixed in with all these dark colors but yet it's it's done so well that there's this like harmonious um connection between all these colors it, do it doesn't take away from the entire painting from the message you know your your focal point is where uh, everybody's looking at rather than w how it's painted as much you know like uh, all of them all the colors all the um variation of tones uh don't take the limelight in any way so he had a really amazing understanding um and his paintings are very busy you know a lot of these paintings you'll see going forward uh they have a lot going on as well um so these are the um Four truths, and I'm going to take some time to uh, talk about each one. Um, also, just something that what he was really recognized for going forward. And you guys will see what was considered to be normal-esque by some of these uh, critics. You know, and I, I want to say that um, part of it, part of them, it, it was a good thing you know, probably pushed Norman Rockwell to actually take on more important subjects, considering that he was such an amazing artist. As you could see, his his painting had such powerful feeling and in, in, in invoked intrigue that um, painting more meaningful uh, work would have like a, a bigger impact on the audience and make people really think about stuff, you know, rather than just appealing to this like, uh, you know, um, heartwarming moments, which I do find to be important still. Looking at it, at his work, and I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to see that stuff. Um, granted, it might be a little bit more geared towards, uh, you know, white privilege of, of its time, especially. Um, but uh, despite that, you know, uh, not thinking about skin color, but just the implications of it, I think it's something that a, a lot of people can relate to like moments of of christmas when you are gathered with your family and you guys are connecting with one another and you're uh showing appreciation for each other and, and creating uh, memorable moments like i think that's something that applies to anybody regardless of their skin color so taking a looking at a look at that work and having that be a reminder is i think a positive uh note um but anyways going back to these four truths the first one i believe from what i'm looking at it has to do with the idea of freedom of speech and what it looks like is this guy is part of the jury and he's standing up and he's uh, and he's voicing his opinion and that's something that obviously if we take a look at even now to this day absurd 
there are countries out there that don't allow this. You know, there are people in Iran, number one. Number two, we got Russia. You know, what they're doing all over, it's crazy. It's absolutely insane. Um, so there's just a lot of countries that don't give you that opportunity. I think that's something that we take for granted and we don't recognize, or some people don't recognize how amazing that is, uh, that we have this, this freedom to be able to just speak our minds, say whatever we'd like, um, and not have to, f not have to face execution. Um, but just talking about it technically, I really enjoy the amount of detail that is put into of course the hands all the hands that you see in that in that painting specifically um once again it has this like element to it that's even more realistic than photographs it really pops out um and and you could just see the the, the grit and texture um on those on those hands i think it's that's incredible uh, I love the color mixture for the faces as well, like the the guy that's on the bottom right, and the guy on the on the bottom left as well. Like they're both the the amount of uh, mixing the uh, of color and paint and um, all the little wrinkles and fine little details, but it doesn't seem overworked. That's the amazing part as well. Is that um, he, the way he paints them all? There's this like very natural feel for it especially like looking at the jacket as well like at the guy in a, in, a, in a focus in the middle like looking at the jacket you could really tell what sort of material it is um and it has this like worn quality to it as well um as well as uh, his face expression i think again it just highlights how he's a very well-rounded illustrator he doesn't only just focus on realism and how amazing he could render something. He doesn't just focus on colors. It's all of those things, including uh, having emotion in their painting. So he breathes life into the painting in so many different ways. And you could, you could tell that it's such a monumental moment, not just from the fact that there are people who are looking up um, at him as he's making a speech. It's also within his face, you know, that you could tell there's like this genuine depth in what he's saying. And I think that's incredible. I think that's beautiful art right there. You know, that's the kind of art that I love looking at. One that really invokes all these emotions and ideas into your head. Um, so moving on, next one, we got um, what I think is your ability to practice your religion. You know, uh, and I think this is something that's been violated r recently with fanatics and people who are just... Um, I don't know, they just want to be part of the process, so they're just creating as many problems as possible. Um, you know, prior, church and state was separated, so whatever you chose to practice was your freedom. If you wanted to be a Muslim, if you wanted to be Jewish, if you wanted to be a Buddhist or Christian or whatever it is, there, there was no, uh, no need to impose anything. And I feel like that's that's one of our liberties here in the States is to be able to practice any religion as long as it's not imposing itself on others, you know, and right now it's the complete opposite. We got people who are extremists and fanatics um, imposing their way on pretty much everybody uh, while contradicting themselves and uh, talking about freedom of choice when it's a convenient, you know, so... Uh, we got domestic terrorists, basically, people who are, hate accountability and, and enforce it on others. Uh, they have absolutely no point. You know, whatever points they're making, they're contradicting themselves, which is um, in lines of terrorism. Like, this is how you terrorize people. This is how you terrorize uh, nations. Um, but anyways, yeah one of the things that we should be demanding is our freedom to um, exercise whatever religion we feel connects with us, as long as it doesn't impose itself on others. Um, and then the next one, moving on, we got the sense of security, right? The ability for us to be able to uh, have our family around, you know, uh, have them 
sleep peacefully and for you to be at peace knowing that they're well taken care of you could tell by it just like how the parents are are dressed the amount of toys that are on the floor the sort of bedding that they have that they're very comfortable it's a comfortable secure life uh which is to say more um more so than a lot of other places as well you know other other countries as well um again beautiful work beautiful painting uh all around um their face expressions have a lot of emotion in them especially from the mother and the father you could tell that they're just um well they love their children for one and um they admire the position that they're in or they admire their kids um yeah great message as well i think beautiful beautiful work uh next we got the abundance the abun um, abundance of food that we have that we have this opportunity to come together as a family and share a big meal and um, everybody has plenty you know which is again uh, something that uh, a lot of people across the globe might not be in a position in uh, so th yeah these are just paintings that he was very well known for for uh, concepts that were more deep than just um, you know heartwarming moments which is uh, what this would be considered. You know, this is something that uh, I think is also pretty iconic of him. I remember seeing a lot of this stuff when I was growing up as well. Um, but I still enjoy it. I really like um, the vibe, you know, I, uh, the, the idea. This is like a very endearing sort of moment uh, of kids being so excited by Christmas and just wondering what is it in each of those uh, boxes and presents. Um, and the mailman just really getting a kick out of that experience as well. So once again, just great face expressions for the mailman. And uh, this kind of shows actually what I was talking about a little bit. And I'll point it out more so as we go through um, other paintings. Uh, just looking at the kid at the very left, right? There's like a certain, there's realism in this painting. You could tell by all the rendering. Um, but also it's kind of fantastical, like there's something um, exaggerated and stylized in these paintings, or in this painting, especially coming from that kid on, on the left, on the very left. Um, but I, I really also like how Norman Rockwell uses white as, as a form of, um, of design. How it doesn't really take away... Um, from the painting and it doesn't say you know oh he doesn't understand uh, or know how to draw anything in a background obviously from the previous paintings it's not a problem for him at all whatsoever right considering things like uh the painting of ruby bridges uh to the four truths um you guys saw plenty of backgrounds there so it's not so much uh of an issue for him but it sometimes come in, comes in useful depending on the sort of focus that he wants to put in or just aesthetically it's more pleasing and i think this kind of plays into this idea of like winter and snow and christmas being around the corner um also take note of a dog that's something that is common in his paintings as well it kind of adds to this like well what was considered to be normal normal-esque uh, element you know these very um you know perfect life sort of scenarios the american dream right of a white picket fence and for um two kids and and a dog or something um that sort of vibe this painting is also great uh, and it took me a moment to actually realize what was going on there at first i thought what a great demonstration of how well he's able to draw faces and how um, well he's able to create a different type of faces. You know, sometimes you'll see artists and they draw basically the same face, but minor things change, like hairstyle changes or clothes are changed, or maybe a little bit of their size is changed. But overall, if you look at the faces, they're all pretty, this, pretty much the same. Whereas here, I think it's such an area of like different looking ones and different features um i found it to be really interesting and it wasn't until i took a moment to observe and question like what's going on here that i recognized that this is just a, um, a painting of 
how uh, information gets passed down sometimes uh, and how, um, you know, the game of telephone ends up ruining a lot of things as well, you know. So here you could see at the very top le or left, uh, this woman is what looks like gossiping about somebody behind or somebody she knows to, uh, to her friend. And then her friend goes and tells her other friend and um, her, that woman ends up telling her husband. Her husband tells another woman that he knows. That woman spreads it to somebody who is either a friend or a neighbor. That neighbor has a conversation with her friend, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you could see how it's all the way down uh, to the very last um, group. And that group is the same woman that you see at the top, um, top left. So it's her husband, I'm going to guess, or maybe it's a friend uh, who, who's like reprimanding her for spreading rumors. Um, but it's just interesting kind of a depiction of like how really information can travel and how sometimes what we think would be the case by the time it ends up being all the way passed along until it gets back to you, it turns out to be so many different things or uh, such a twisted uh, scenario of what happens uh, day to day or what happens in reality. Here, I think this is a great painting as well. Um, again, I think it's some uh, an interesting message, presence of a dog, hint, hint there again. Um, but I think it highlights something that's important. Um, something that happens in modern day as well uh, where i think people get married and they have different points of views on politics and i think at that time it wasn't as important it was more about just you know um continuing on a certain tradition or like they're introduced to uh, somebody and or they marry really young and um by the time they're in the workforce, a certain workforce has um, has a certain vibe and an element there. You're, you're working for people who are well established, who are paying your bills. And I think in a lot of cases with these like capitalist systems, um, you got people who have very strong points of views. And the way some of these employees work is they t uh, tend to appease uh, the person they're working for by conforming their ideas to the person they're working with um, rather than forming their own ideas and their own points of views and that sometimes ends up ingraining itself into the person's behavior uh, and i think sometimes people don't want to rock the boat and they'll agree or eventually condition themselves to think and act like them to fit in and continue to work there and this is a big problem because it creates um well it really does create uh, this sort of like toxic environment, you know, at, at home or in your personal life or even for yourself, you know, you might end up really conforming and forgetting about yourself or your own points of views and just becoming a replica of the person at work. And they might not necessarily be the best person or a good person to begin with. So uh, the fact that you're there every day, seven days or, or seven hours a uh, or eight hours rather, or even more, you know, depending on the job, uh, you end up really being that more so throughout the day than you are being yourself. So you end up coming home and uh, this kind of depicts that, um, this this scenario, you know, somebody, uh, two, um, two people having opposing views, well, two, two people married, uh, and I would imagine one is more conservative, the other one is more democratic, and they're just kind of sitting there and arguing. And sometimes the person arguing for it, what their beliefs are, isn't because they actually believe in it, it's because uh, they've conditioned themselves to, you know. And if they are spoken out of it, it's going to create problems for them fitting in and being at work and, and um, you know, not getting along with the people there who have completely opposing views. And you could see that they're just bickering there, and the kid is really frustrated by it, all of that. Um, so I think it creates a lot of a lot of problems. I think having people um, conform to these things, not being at, um, at the freedom of 
being who they are in work environments is is a huge problem as well. Um, now, I think that at some point, of course, there is um, there's a need for connection. There's a need for people to get along, but I think I don't think that it should be at, at the expense of your um, political points of views. I think that's something that needs to be completely uh, removed from from work environments. Um, but anyways, young couple, and you know they haven't really um, had a chance to venture out and be who they imagine themselves to be. It's a, a lot of conditioning. It's conditioning from you know, being in college, graduating, and then jumping into workforce, getting married, there isn't any period for them to develop their own points of views, and it's all just kind of uh, enforced on them. So, you know, they're in college, and they're part of, like, fraternities or whatever. That's shaping them and conditioning them to think and ac accept certain standards and ways. And then from there, they're thrown into either marriage or workforce where it just perpetuates you know that same conditioning perpetuates on there so um yeah it doesn't leave much room for people to uh start really establishing their own uh personality their own ways of thinking um but anyways i think it's a great painting i think that's one of the things about it is that it kind of makes you think about all these things you know having people um share political beliefs is really important in order for there to be like some sort of stability and a connection there as opposed to what you're seeing here parents completely at opposite opposite ends um and i think it's important because political views are very much different than like okay i don't see i don't like the same music that you do that's not a big deal whereas political views i think have a lot to do with like morality and um shaping culture and shaping how people interact with each other so if you got a husband who's incredibly racist while you're not really sharing that point of view that's that's a big deal that's not uh, that's not something that i feel like people can just like you know water under the bridge forget about it not a big deal it, it, it has a rippling effect in other scenarios as well um but i think at that time it wasn't the focus the important thing was getting married having kids and that's pretty much it having a job that you work in having kids um but i think in the long run people end up being unhappy because of these disconnects because of the fact that they don't share these points of views and um having to like sacrifice your uh your principles and values as opposed to meeting somebody who has the same as as yours um anyways i'm not going to go too much about it um gonna move on to the next one and this is another example of like that hallmark sort of moment you know but i think it's uh very well done it's beautiful work still there's something that i really love about the window panes um uh, just a different amount of color mixture there like the greens and yellows and reds i think brings that texture really brings them out more and I think they kind of make the painting, you know, I guess in, co in contrast to all the red that's there, um, I think it goes well with like the Christmas hanging, that uh, Christmas ornament that's hanging on the window. It, it kind of um, balances things out, you know, having that lighter green connecting with um, that ornament as well as the one that's hanging at the bottom, bottom right. Um, it's all compositionally done well. There's like that red of the bricks to the red hue of like the people and the background as well. Um, with that green as well. You know, they're all balanced out very well there. Um, and also good use of white, I think. Uh, mixed throughout the painting, as you could see from the twigs to some of the snow that's settled on the windows, which is what they're checking out. You know, it's that first day where snow has settled and it's Christmas. Um, but heartwarming uh, moment, and you could see by the expression of the, the mother and her being in the moment with her kids as well. Uh, very, um, very well done. The face expression is excellent. Um, but all around, again, it just seems like it's a photograph that was rendered to be a drawing or a painting. But really, it's just his work. You know, it's all just his paintings. 
uh, done so well. You know, his brush strokes, his color choices, the composition, the ideas behind it, it's, uh, it's incredible. Moving on, another uh, really interesting painting that I liked uh, that demonstrates his understanding of uh, mood. You know, this is such a mood uh, painting. The fact that there is this red there, I think, adds to um, the coziness, I think, of this painting. Um, it, it looks like a hotel. You know, it looks like this guy ha has... Uh, some business to take care of. He's staying in this uh, hotel, which is a small room. You could tell by just how he's laying in bed playing uh, solitaire. There isn't really much room for him to sit and actually do it, but he has a suitcase there and he's just uh, smoking a cigarette and playing playing cards. But I really like that about this painting is that um, the use of that red really brings this uh, cozy vibe. Um, Also, um, the light and how he uses that uh, color at the top, giving giving everything else kind of like this uh, luminous sort of um, element, um, is also very well done. And and it kind of reminds me of that painting that you guys saw of uh, Howard Pyle's work, where he has a man that's standing in in um, candlelight reading a letter. And how well that was painted, you know, having to distribute all that red all around to give this like emanating sort of glow around him, I think is um, incredible, incredible work. Uh, same thing here and how that illuminates his face, you know, just certain features and how he created the folds yet still maintaining that red tone throughout um, is um, incredibly skilled. Um, but overall, I just, I really dig the, uh, the atmosphere, the vibe, and how it feels like it's a very warm, cozy environment. I think he executed that pretty well. Um, another, and this is something that I do remember actually as a kid as well, seeing this at diners or seeing it at, in all sorts of places. Um, his work, I just remember seeing it at a lot of different places. Um, but just this scene of of a kid admiring something that he wants to be probably as he grows up, you know, the way that he's looking at the cop, it, it's with admiration. It's like, oh, this hero here that's sitting by me. Um, unfortunately, that isn't really the case in a lot of a lot of instances modern day. Um, but it is an endearing moment, and I guess when things were still kind of new or developing towards the better. At the time, um, it does capture uh, a nice sentiment. And of course, I'm not going to say all cops across are the same. So it could be that, of course, this guy is an upstanding cop and he's really good at his work. Uh, but I really, what I really enjoy is the guy in the background, the one who's standing behind the counter, and how well Norman Rockwell was able to capture that face expression. Um, there's a certain, like, relaxed. Um, feeling but it's done so well and it's done so realistically um, that it, it really makes it pop out more and also just paying attention to how many different colors that he used like if you look at his forehead there's like multitude of colors there there's white there's yellow there's some blue red and orange um, and I'm sure you know if I was to see it up close it would be uh, it would be more as well but just how textured his paintings are um, is really incredible I absolutely love that about his work um, compositionally again it's really good I, I like that nobody really has center focus here like the cop himself uh, despite having like the brightest face out of the three um, doesn't really take up the full focus as i mentioned the guy in the background has a really cool face expression also very well rendered the kid has a, um, a very endearing look on his face um but yeah everything compositionally works so well if you look at the chairs for example uh the ones that they're sitting on they're bright green whereas the ones on the side they kind of um are faded 
a little bit it's not as bright green in fact some parts of it uh, all the way towards the edges are diminished and i think that's purposely done compositionally to just kind of bring in the center focus towards what's going on um great use of white as well all around but not it's not just plain white there's still su some elements there to suggest texture which i think is really cool and if you look at like the frames within um within the table they're also kind of faded on the sides as well so again just like honing in the focus towards the the middle thing is great uh great composition will work next we got this painting right here um i absolutely love this one uh so many different face expressions so many different uh colors used as well but all once again despite having so many different colors and um variations in tone it all works um harmoniously and if you notice there isn't anybody in a very center that uh everybody's kind of together in on this but there isn't any center focus and of course the message here is you know uh, no matter where you come from what you look like uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you so it's this like golden rule and i think it's it's important i think nobody really wants to be treated poorly nobody wants to be uh dismissed exploited used or whatever whatever it is um and that's the best way to interact. That's the best way to build, I think, um, culture. The best way to build community is to follow that, you know, um, and just stay away from people who don't like to do it. Um, nobody wants to subject themselves to poor treatment. Um, but it's a it's a great message, uh, and I really like how he used pretty much all religions com combined um, to say it. I don't see, uh, personally, I don't see any religion that would say, yeah, you know, uh, treat other people worse, but expect them to treat you amazing. Like, what religion would really support that or incites that? I don't think any. So when, uh, whenever people call themselves religious and then they go and do, do something terrible, like they become incredibly racist or they support gun violence or... Uh, you know, they're psychologically abusing and using people and all this other stuff. And then they say, oh, I'm Christian or I am uh, this, that, and the other, or this religion. It's like, no, you're not. You're just completely bullshitting because if you were, you wouldn't actually be doing any of these things. The things that your religion talks about is like being a good person, treating people well. No religion says treat everybody awful except yourself. You know, that's, that's not the point of the religion. The point of the religion is to... Um, create more harmonious connection and to make people act decent and to be good people so you know if people call themselves religious while they go and execute people or you know what you're seeing in iran right now or like abusing women or kids having them work in slave labor conditions or work in general like child labor you know none of those are uh, values uh of like any religion really so um yeah i think a lot of the times it's just used to gaslight people like we are awful but we're going to use religion to veil it so that we're not targeted uh, and dismissed and um basically diminished our our profits which is what they care about just a bunch of money like we don't want our profits to diminish uh, which goes to say that's where their Achilles heel is. Like, uh, diminishing their profits is what gets them thinking about, well, maybe we shouldn't act the way that we do. Um, anyways, I think, um, once again, yeah, just beautiful painting. Uh, how he renders every single person, the amount of texture that's on the woman who's holding up the baby, well, both women, really, um, is, is absolutely incredible. Here, this is another Gilly, um, Willie Gillis. <laughs> I, I keep wanting to say Gilligan's Island, 
but it's Willie Gillis. That's just the series, um, the name of the series. Um, and before I used to think that this was a picture, but I think that's what the purpose of it is. It's supposed to um, look like a photograph, um, a painting of a photograph. And uh, I really like the face expression of the guy in, well, at the top right, the one who's like smoking a cigarette, I guess. And there's like so much detail there and there's so much character in that face. And as well as the, the guy in the middle, um, the really interesting face expressions there. I'm guessing this is just a continuation or another painting of um, the four truths in the moment where somebody steps up to um, to say what they feel and how they feel about things. The freedom of speech. Um, just another way of painting it. And I really like it because it also has like a bit of a... It's slightly different because it does have a bit of like a painterly quality to it. Like it's still realistic, but certain elements like the coat... Uh, or some parts of the hand, or even the guy at the bottom right, or left rather, that there, you could see like this painterly effect to it. And uh, here is another element of, um, I guess like kids moment, you know, kids uh, developing and you could see like, that is this like ego battle that they're having and it's just this um i guess it is one of those normal-esque moments but i i personally just like how it depicts this like growing process and you see these two kids they're both having an ego trip you got this kid in the background who uh seems to be more um i'm gonna say more reserved more thoughtful not as um uh, emotionally triggered or um not as heavily involved and he's just kind of like overlooking to see what's gonna happen um but i really like how it's a little bit of both it has like this illustrator element to it uh, notice there's a dog also at the bottom right um but yeah it has a little bit of that illustration vibe to it um that it's not it's realistic but at the same time you look at their faces and there is a bit of exaggeration there um so it's a good mix of in between like painterly and uh, realism and and slight illustration and also it kind of depicts like this like growing pains period you know they're lanky there are certain features that are extremely exaggerated or um yeah not incredibly realistic but at the same time, um, how it's rendered shows some bit of realism. This is another perfect example of how amazing uh, his color work is and how amazing his painting technique is. Um, it looks as if though it's right there for you to be able to 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 see it happen. You know, it's it's different vibe completely from a photograph but it's also very realistic. Um, especially how well he did the chair. You know, there's so much detail there. There's so much stuff going on, like how it's um, setting in, right? Where he's sitting, it's like um, sinking in towards the middle and he was able to capture that. The ruffling around uh, the chair itself, I think it was really well done. Um, he was able to do it with all the little detail too in, in uh, proportion to the folds, I think is also incredible. Uh, but all these colors there mixed well together. It still looks well. There's nothing jarring about it. You know, you could tell, of course, that there's so much going on on the, on the chair. But despite that, the kids sitting in there, it all works together. You know, again, I think it's that tone. He's able to... Um, capture the right tone of colors for all the things despite that blue being very different and the color of the jeans being different they're still um tone wise they're still pretty close like the green and the blue 
are pretty close in tone. Um, and I'm going to say even the yellow. It's not incredibly bright yellow. It, it kind of works with that, like the yellow that you see on the sock, it kind of works with that pink that's on the chair a little bit. It's, it's close in tone there. It's not super bright. It's not incredibly dull. It's right in between. Um, but uh, I really like how well he's able to like also capture the face expression um, and the expression of his hands as well. Like looking at the hands, you could tell that he's really trying. He's really trying to learn the instrument. And of course, by uh, his face expression as well, it's both. Um, the rendition of the hair, just looking at that, it's incredible. You know, it doesn't look, it doesn't look like it's painted and it doesn't look hyper realistic. Um, but yet it's just right in the middle. It's hard to describe. And I guess that's what makes Norman Rockwell so, uh, recognizable and such an incredible artist is he's able to balance out and, uh, play that those two realities and merge them into these in incredible paintings. Um, I absolutely love how he rendered the jeans. Uh, it's, I think it's r really incredible how he used those colors, um, how he created all these like indentations there. I am speechless. Looking at his work leaves me speechless. Sometimes I just run out of words to describe how incredible his work is and i hope you guys are enjoying it just as much as i am um i'm having a blast with this but i think it is slowly creeping up to an hour and a half so i'm gonna do one more which is this painting right here and this is a perfect example of what i was talking about before how he mixes uh this like realism and illustration together like they're super lanky look at their legs they're incredibly tall but um the amount of detail that goes into it, and especially the guy in the very background, like looking at the leg and seeing all the, those like weird bony kind of lines, I really enjoy that. I think that's very characteristical. Um, but it shows this like growing pain sort of element, right? And uh, moments of egos flaring. These kids are trying to assert themselves and uh, speak their truths and demand that everybody else hears what they, their point of view is literally pointing at what their view is. Um, and I also really like the composition. So along with like the guy's leg and the many different uh, lines that you see on there, which is really cool. I really like the basketball, like how it's rendered. It looks so real, very realistic. Again, it's just like more real than paint, than the photograph real. Like just um, so many different colors there mixed in. And the, those thin lines going where the indentations are really pops out the ball. Really gives it even more depth and dimension. Um, to like just looking at the legs. And you could see like there's certain bruises on there. So there's like that yellow blue uh, bruise that's on the leg on the left. Uh, just looking at that and how many different colors are present there. Looking at the arm and seeing how many different colors are in there. Uh, it's so cool. Absolutely love it exaggerated face expressions to uh, to to just denote how much emotion is there in each one of them i absolutely love it and i kind of think how funny it is it really does depict like these growing pains where you see like super long legs tiny torsos lanky uh just lanky in general it's, it's kind of funny but very well done of course um, and that's pretty much where I'm going to end it, guys. Um, I am gushing about Norman Rockwell. Unfortunately, it took up, well, I don't know, depending on how you see it. I really enjoyed it. Uh, it took up most of the stream. There are a few more artists, uh, and they're all very interesting and fun. I, I'm going to enjoy talking about all of them. I hope you guys are uh, enjoying it as much as well. Leave a comment. You know, tell me how you feel about all these artists, how, how you feel about these paintings, which one is your favorite so far, which one really connects with you, which one do you enjoy the most. Uh, share your opinions and your thoughts. Um, there's a lot more to come. There's uh, several more artists. Each of them have their own style. Each of them have their own uh, uniqueness. Um, so stick around for that. Well, 
look out for that rather i'm not going to continue on this is a pretty long stream um but that there's more to come throughout the week there's also going to be another special intro that's going to be not related to uh gil elfgren it's going to be a concert that's coming up this week i'm super excited to share that with you guys so uh, make sure you check out the posts i'm going to be posting when uh when that special intro is going to be um so that pretty much pretty much does it everybody uh thanks for tuning in i hope you guys enjoyed that as much as i did and if you enjoy this content make sure to remember to hit the like and subscribe button they both help the stream they're both greatly appreciated and i will see you tomorrow <laughs>